Hey everyone, and welcome to Evandale, and more specifically this episode, which we're going to cover the country of Mutfia. This is one of my favorite countries in the world of Evandale. It's certainly one of the oldest that has seen the most action in terms of campaigns uh, around the table. And it is without a doubt um, one of the, if not the most favorite uh, country or setting uh, within the world of Evandale for the tabletop players that uh, I've had the pleasure to, uh, to game with over the, uh, over the decades now. Mutfia got its start um, as one of the first developed countries sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. I want to say it was around the early 80s and really got to uh, be known sometime in the 90s, uh, early 90s. Uh, as one of the uh, um, one of the oh boy uh, <laughs> one of the first official tabletop sessions and some of those players are currently playing as a matter of fact we're still playing uh, that game or a continuation of it so let's get right into it where exactly is Mutfia well here you see the world of Evandale and right in the smack dab middle of it uh, towards the north is the country of Mutfia. Um, this is a rather uh, isolated place, despite uh, its uh, its location within the world. You would think that it would be a trade hub given its central location, but it's actually not. And there's a reason for that. Geographically speaking, this is isolated. Let me pull up a the new map to it. Um, let me get the interactive map here. Uh, one second. And here you go. This is the new full map of Mutfia itself. All the way here to the east, you can see that there's a very wide river that surrounds it and comes all the way down to the south and isolates it further with mountains that continue to wrap all the way around on the western side. To the north, you have a sea that sees some trade uh, coming in from us uh, from some of the other nations in the area, uh, particularly um, uh, to its east. You have, well, that is Mutfia there, but to its east, further east. You have the city of Kulchrek, and then, of course, to its west, uh, to the far west, you have uh, Ibarri. These nations alone are pretty much responsible for some of the trade that comes into the area, but let's talk more about the country itself and what it is that we can expect to see. As you can tell, Mutfia is not a very bright place. The map was designed dark for this reason. Other maps in the future, um, uh, which you will see, are going to be a little bit lighter in color, so really, this is, this is actually what it's like color-wise. Um, all the way to the north in the colder regions, you're going to see plenty of uh, pine and larch and other uh, coniferous trees, uh, evergreens, which lend to a very dark feel in, in and amongst uh, all these trees. It's really a, not a deforested country whatsoever. Uh, the inhabitants, uh, the people within it, really only take what it is that they need from the land because they believe the land itself is alive. And to some degree, that is true. Superstition is all throughout this land, uh, from the river Gergi and what it holds, the wide uh, uh, dividing river that goes from north to the south of uh, all of Mutfia. This river is the lifeblood of it, uh, of the country itself. And in the past, the country was divided between east and west. Um, in the past, we're talking about uh, the Mutfia that we know today in the Fourth Age is about, culturally speaking, is about 3,000 years old. In the year 3223, a war known as the Libertine War had taken place that divided the east which you see here to the east of uh, to the east and north and in some cases down to the south of the Gergi River uh, from the western portion all the way from here and then Lake Lot, which we're going to get into. We're going to get into a lot of detail throughout this and all points west of the river. Uh, several bumbling generals, although they were tactical masters in their own right, and yet they made a series of mistakes which no historian or tactician today can ever uh, truly explain. Their war ended up uh, causing the country as it was then um, to be devoid of all nobles. And that act alone really set the course for a country that would eventually be, be led by the commoners. The 
all, where did all the nobles go? Well, they all died in the war. Um, those that uh, from the east were afraid that the west was going to invade, and those from the west thought that the east was going to invade. They ended up uh, countering each other and moving all around. Um, and in the end, so many died that this is the reason why they say that the land is greasy with the rendered fat of all of those deaths. Well, as all of the nobles uh, died in the war, the commoners then rose up and began to inhabit some of those empty castles and keeps and manor houses that existed all throughout the land. And as such, none of them could ever agree on a centralized government, and that is why today Mutfia is known as a land of a thousand princes, for there are that many. However, it's, well, it's more like 500 or so, but a thousand princes tends to roll over the tongue. There are three castes within Mutfia, or so they say. A caste is something that typically you are born into, and here you have the nobles, the uh, members of the noble house who have an ancestral noble blood within them. You have the commoner peasantry. Uh, they are the uh, really the meat and the bone of the country itself. And, of, and then you have the itinerant people, which are collectively known as the Drosti. And they range anything from um, uh, traveling wizards to, uh, to mercenaries and all types in between. And it, altogether, these people are known as Mutvi. And they have a language that is rather... Um, it, to those on the outside, it sounds like it's fluid and beautiful, and you'll actually hear some of it. You'll learn a little bit more about the alphabet, but let's start getting into some of the details, and then we're going to get into even more as we go. Um, first, let's get into an overview of it. Uh, and Muti, as I said, is known as the land of a thousand princes. It does not have a centralized government. Uh, any attempt to form a government has always met with failure. There's never been any kind of a success. Instead, what ends up happening is that somebody declares themselves a prince by standing on a parcel of land. And if they continue to hold that land, then they are seen as a leader of that land or a prince. In the Mutvian tongue, this is known as a stroikis. And the stroikis, male or female, makes no difference. Titles are all the same all throughout Evendale. Um, a stroikis is, um, it, you become known as a stroikis after you have succeeded, successfully held the land, not only against the peasantry who may rise up against you or other nobles who may try to take your land from you, but also the creatures that inhabit all of the woods. We will absolutely be getting into that as well. Uh, for those who make up uh, all of Muthia, you are looking at the vast majority of them as humans. Um, there are some Feranil, which come from the west in Sa'abri. These are the far side elves. You have the Sindaril. Um, the Ashen Elves, they come from east across the river, which you can see you know, right here, as a matter of fact, uh, just above my head. Um, and there are some halflings that have also settled into the area for a variety of reasons. Now, the primary language all throughout this country is Mutvian itself, but there is a northern dialect and there is a southern dialect. And you can tell if you really want to get into the role play aspects of this particular setting, um, somebody who rolls their R's a lot would be said to come from the south, and while those who come from the north are tap their R's just a little bit, as opposed to actually rolling them. Um, in, uh, while there is no real-world correspondence to any of the lands in Evendale, I would have to say that Mutvia, um, just owing to how old I was when I first created it, it, it does have some real-world correlations. To the north, you may say that they are um, a little bit like Romanian, and to the south, a little bit like Russian. But this is really only in terms of accent and some of the names uh, of, uh, of the places and some of the names of the noble houses and the uh, naming conventions of certain towns. And you'll see that as we uh, delve into the map in a little bit. The geography itself would hold that Mutfi is a fairly large country by its own right. It's about the size of a medium-sized, um, eh, small to medium-sized European country. It's 340 miles east to west at its widest point, uh, widest point to widest point, um, and average is more like 250 miles, and almost a clean 500 miles from north to south. Uh, there's a wide diversity of uh, geology there, uh, which is rather... Um, it used to be incredibly active back in the day, you know, like 10,000 years, 20,000 years ago. 
it was the most active volcanically speaking in the area. Today, there's only one volcano that still stands out uh, on the horizon as a volcano, and that is Mount Veresh. And we're going to see that when we start getting into the culture, because that is a holy site to the god Nordaga. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, separated uh, from the rest of the world by very dangerous mountains, not only the geography, but also the creatures that live within it. We are talking uh, all sorts of beasts, uh, border uh, Mutfia, many of them chased away from the villages to the periphery and then kept there by the countries on the outside. Sa'abri to the west has uh, tribal uh, parties that go out and try to hunt down anything that leaked out of Mutfia, so they keep it in Mutfia. And the Mutfians, they have a slightly different way of dealing with things. They don't always go out there and they kill. Instead, they have superstitions which keep these things at bay. And in a way, while there's a spoken language within the country, there's also a different language, and that is one of survival, where garlic braids are hung out by the door in order to keep the street going away. If you happen to see a Volniki or something like this, I'm borrowing heavily from uh, Eastern European legends um, uh, from our own world. It's one of the only places where you're going to see that. Um, if you happen to see a Volniki, you better play its game and win, otherwise your soul will be sucked into a teacup. Um, if you go into certain woods, you're going to come across creatures there that are half animal and half man. Um, they live by the light of the two moons or none of that light at all. And again, we're going to get into that in a little bit too. Um, many of the buildings within Woodfield can withstand the attacks of some of these creatures just due to the wood that is used. There is a, a, fa a fantastic amount of oak within the country. Uh, primarily in the central regions. Um, up north it's primarily larch. You're going to see some hickory throughout as well. Uh, for those of you that are really into woods, there's pines and all sorts of things like that. You're going to come across some maples as we, as we continue south. Um, but again, they only take what they need in a way due to the old traditions of revering the land. Now, culturally, it is one of the oldest continuous cultures and by continuous, I mean like, as it says here, about 3,000 years old. And this is an incredibly superstitious people. So these superstitions have built up over the millennia and with very little change. Mutfia was at one point a technological success, again, about 3,000 years ago. And they had some of the best weapons, some of the best armor, some of the best fighting tactics. So martially, they were absolutely fantastic. But then this war, the Libertine War, broke out, ended up killing nearly everyone within the country. The land absorbed all the blood and the death and became a land of nightmare and blood and death. And ever since then, the people who continue to survive, almost by Darwinian law, if you survive, it's because you know how. You don't try to fight whatever it is that's in the woods. Um, these things are nasty. Um, some of the superstitions would be, uh, again, borrowed heavily from Eastern European uh, cultures. If you knock, if you hear a single knock at the door and your voice is called out, don't answer it. Don't even make a noise. Don't say anything. Um, there are creatures like this all throughout Evendale, um, but they really exist in, uh, in, uh, in Lutfia. Um, if you open the door after that first knock, after your name has been called, your soul is gone forever. And it is that, that kind of a dangerous place. On the more fantastical side of things, um, you're talking about houses that can eat you. And I don't mean like, like some movies where it literally eats you. I mean, you go in there and it feeds off of your life force and replenishes the house. So there are, um, for those of you who played in Mutria LARP, uh, you may have heard of Laratosa. Laratosa... Um, Came from a character background that was submitted by an old uh, player of ours, Walter, who um, uh, he, he kind of gave some details and I kind of took it and ran with it. And Laratosa turned out to be a vampire uh, who wasn't home one day when they came across, or one evening when they came across this house. And they stayed inside the house and it, they began to feel weak as time passed. Um, and then they discovered why. And it's the story I just told you. Um, and so things like this exist all throughout Mutfi, and this lends more to its culture of sacrifice and feasts and festivals, which remind everyone of the verdant life that exists within the country. 
Always celebrate community and family. Stay close to each other. Never venture out alone at night. As a matter of fact, never venture out at night, period. Um, but for those of you who do, um, there are things that you should always remember. And this is the legends and the lores that are passed down. So if you as a GM enjoy settings where it is really lore heavy and you want to see if you're visiting PCs uh, or maybe even native Mutfian PCs, want to know their stuff and know how to survive, you can stick a level one party against like a, the equivalent of a CR-15 or Challenge Rating 15 and being extremely powerful in uh, gaming parlance. Um, and if they know the superstitions and the lore, they may actually be able to keep that creature at bay. But at that, at that level, you're talking about some really ancient rare lore because you're not going to see those kind of creatures everywhere. Um, but moving on. So the isolation is caused geographically, but also by the surrounding hostility. While it's just a sea to the north, it's a cold sea. There's really not a lot of reason to head into it. Um, Woodfians are not known for their travel. They are xenophobic people. They want to really keep to themselves. Well, off to the east, excuse me, off to the east, you have the kingdom of the Slindori, and these are the, uh, the Ashen Elves, uh, that were exiled there tens of thousands of years ago, and they have been building up their own stuff. They don't want to be invaded. They don't want to be touched by anybody, let alone the Mutfians. So in a way, the Mutfians are a um, the perfect neighbor to the Sundari, and the Sundari are the perfect neighbors to the Mutfians. But while they would never cross each other, and they don't talk with each other, they don't get a cup of sugar from each other, they just don't bother with each other. And for that reason, they are actually the perfect neighbors. But off to the west you have Sta'abri, and Sta'abri is a tribal nation with all sorts of hordes, and one of the tribes that is closest to Mutfi, and perhaps also the perfect partner, are the Void Crawlers, and the Void Crawlers are a nasty tribe that, uh, that celebrate the element of void, where this is a, it's just a, a bad, just a bad tribe. <laughs> they kind of deal with negative spirituality and other things like that. And so um, Mutfians tend to stay away from them. Thus, they stay inside their country. And the Void Walkers don't want to get eaten alive by the land itself. So they tend to stay outside of Mutvia. Um, also, to the northeast, uh, you have uh, way up, way up there, uh, you have this island nation, uh, this city state by the name of Amstrad. And that's going to get its own. Um, uh, that's going to get its own treatment in, a, in its own video. But Amstrad is no joke. Uh, Amstrad is full of ancient magics, wizards who don't want to have anything to do with Mutfia other than use everything there as a test subject. And most Mutfians will not have anything to do with that. And they see Amstrad as the last remnants of the nobles who used to live in the area, used to live in the country. Um, there's a theory that many of the nobles left Mutfia during the war and went north in, into this island state, and they became these ancient wizards that, uh, that oversee the uh, magical colleges and whatnot there in Amstrad. And again, we're not talking Hogwarts. We're talking just some really, really, really weird stuff going on here, um, with all due respect to uh, Miss Rowling. Um, so with all of this going around, you can see why Mutvia has remained pretty much the same all throughout its history, through its modern history, modern being about 3,000 years. And that brings us to its language. Mutvia has a, uh, an actual alphabet. Um, it's actually more like a cipher. Um, the underlying language within it that you can see all throughout here in the background is actually English to some degree. There's some, there's some things there that are changed. There's some uh, diacritical uh, marks within the alphabet as well. Uh, the numbering system is a little bit odd. The sentence structure is a little bit odd. But the language itself sounds a little bit more like a romance language. So you may hear something like, um, And this kind of a guttural sound is something that you will hear all throughout Mutfia um, with its rolling and open vowels. I have it in love languages. And so the Mutfian language, uh, you can actually check out a very small glossary that I currently have online at mutfia.com slash setting slash language. And um, it's, yeah, there's only maybe you know, like 40 words or something like that there right now. But you'll also see some of the subtleties of the language. And because we're talking about a xenophobic people, they never truly know who it is that's new, uh, 
they, they never know who, what the new person actually is. Is this a creature that looks like a human traveler? Is this a neighbor that you know very well, but in secret is a, is a spirit meant to steal your soul and uh, forever plague you with bad luck? No one knows. And so there are subtleties within the language itself, such as, um, I may say, brusosoro mutvi. And brusosoro just means good day. It's actually, you can use it at any time of the day. That's the greeting, as opposed to brusosoro mutvi. Bruso, vruso. The vruso means I usher you to death. Bruso means good day. So there's a <laughs> very subtle, um, if you have a character that speaks Mutvian, um, and you really want to get into it, uh, portray the character as someone who dabbles in, um, in double entendres and in hidden speech, because a stranger, you as a stranger to Mutvi, uh, to Mutvia, you may be greeted with Vrusosoro, as in, we don't want you here, you need to die, but we don't want to be impolite just in case you are something that can actually eat us. In which case, then, we're just going to say, no, we actually said, Bruso Soro, you misheard. <laughs> Our apologies. Um, the, this is not to say that they really speak heavily to, uh, to people um, within, um, strangers, that is. Uh, they don't really believe in introducing themselves or giving their true name to people. So if you come into the country, particularly the northern region in here, uh, Moldev was the setting of the LARP, uh, was surrounded by Gergesui and Ranobesti and Ajdebesti and Korvagera. Um, we'll get into the noble houses in a moment. Um, if you are in this region, uh, this is a, and there's a reason for that. You see this, ah, where is it? This little symbol right here, this little portal. Well, I'll get into that. That's known as the Veiled Gate. Um, the, uh, the people here believe that the names have power, and so you should never introduce or give your real name to someone who can then use that against you. But if you then go to the south, uh, the people here, particularly in the Dracovich lands, they firmly believe that one has the power to stand by your name. And this is one of the few cultural differences between the north and the south. Um, the head of House Tarakovich, who is arguably, the, they hold a land which is quite, quite large, owning almost all of uh, South Central uh, Mutvia, um, and they have the ability to hold on to it due to their alliance with the Drosti, particularly the Lupershkoi. But House Tarakovich is known as one of the more polite houses, and yet one is still the most draconian of the houses. You do not break up your word. You always show hospitality, but you are also expected to be able to uh, fend for yourself. Should you, uh, if you invite a stranger into your home, you are expected to show them, um, your, give them the best meats, uh, give them the best ales or whatever it is you happen to have, but uh, utterly destroy that thing, including if it's just a human. Um, utterly destroy it if they dare to profane your home with any kind of violence. Um, whereas up north, you just won't be invited into a home. And there's some reasons for that. Uh, southern Mutvia does see a little bit of traffic coming in from southern, uh, coming in from southern uh, Kulchak here, the Kajakal Bazaar, which is a city not mentioned in the country's overview video, but will receive its own uh, uh, its own video itself. Uh, the Kabakal Bazaar has its has its own rich, unique history, um, and is definitely something that uh, that's worthy of it. But we'll get into that. There's a lot of trade that comes out of the bazaar, and it typically comes in by following this uh, this mountain range, which uh, lines the missing mountain plains, comes all the way up to the north, and then out to the west of. Uh, um, uh, Ladadesu, and then all the way north from there, following this trade route, which you see here dotted, and then finally entering into the last of the Sabrian horde holes, which is stored in an ord or uh, that belongs to the white bison. I see, oh, white bison. That means white bison. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have to check that. I'm going to have to fix that. If you are a Patreon, uh, uh, if you're a patron of mine, um, at the $5 level, you will get high-resolution images, all 4K, uh, of all of these maps. I'm going to change that. I, I will correct that, I promise. Uh, but nonetheless, the trade routes typically only come in here, 
and then you were left on your own. Uh, while there are plenty of roads that come in through this area and they're not on the map, there are plenty of roads that come in, but you're going to have to come across um, the various uh, towns or uh, villages that are in there, which are full of very angry people that there are, that there's even a such thing as an outsider, let alone one in their, in their backyard. Um, and getting more into the culture here uh, between the North and the South, um, when we talk about culture, we're primarily talking about fear and everything that they do to survive through fear. We're going to get into some of these areas here. If you take a look in this area here, here you will see the Vorochnaya Woods. The Vorochnaya Woods um, line the Landu um, uh, domain to the west. And this is the largest concentration of lycanthropes throughout the Mudfia. Um, there is a group of Drosti, in this case, the Vordankaya Drosti, who regularly patrol this area. Some say that they have befriended the werewolves. Others say that they are um, uh, enemies of the werewolves, but the Vordankaya tend to stay to themselves. And we don't really, we're not too sure exactly what's going on with them. Um, there are many different rumors that surround the Vordankaya. Perhaps if we ever have a, uh, a video, a quick one, just on the Drosti clans and families, uh, we'll get into the Vordankaya, the, um, uh, the Lubrskoi, and, and all of the others. Um, if you go west across the Gergi and you come into this region here, here you're going to come across the Zaganesti Drosti who patrol these lands around the noble domains of the Kovrigera, uh, Zagrevesti, Radovesti, Ajdevesti, and here the, uh, the Zaganesti Drosti, they patrol these lands with uh, introducing a lot of color to it. Um, they, they are extremely festive people. It is said that the Zaganesti, are, um, they know the best ways through the woods, and they are able to sell their secrets to others for a profit, um, they are also showmen, and they will put on a show for you. It may not be the best show, but they, this is how they earn their coin. Um, many of them, there are uh, all sorts of magic users within the Zaganesti. Um, you will find occasionally a druid, which is more a cleric, if you will, of uh, Nordaga. And I'll get into Nordaga in a second. Um, but primarily, there you're looking at hedge mages, uh, while by and large, most of them are like bard types or what have you. If you're playing Pathfinder 1.0, you may find that uh, without the, uh, the Nordic um, influence, you may say that many of them are skalds, uh, particularly the showmen, while others are just straight up fighters, um, because those are the ones that lead the caravans through this area, or the wagons. Um, whereas the Vordenkaya, they tend to stay here in this area. Now, speaking of other Drosti, you know what, since I'm on the topic of Drosti, I might as well cover them. You will notice on the map that there are two regions here where the Lupushkoi Drosti are noted. And uh, one is up north, which I just indicated, and the other one comes down south here in Drakovich lands. There's a reason for that. Drakovich lands are as large as they are because they stand out... Um, uh, separate from other noble houses. They have active dealings with the Lupershkoi. Um, House Drakovich has been known to hand their lands over to caretakers in the Lupershkoi who are very much like mercenaries. And what exactly the tie is in between the Drakovich and Lupershkoi is really uh, tied to just the leaders there and what their agreements are. And it's kind of secret, but no one ever ever goes against their uh, their lord or lady and house Drakovich, and no one ever goes against the head of the clan at the Lupershkoi. Uh, so it's pretty much you have standing orders, this is what you do. And it's for that reason that Drakovich is uh, very well uh, very well protected, um, but they also have something which is uh, which is where their uh, which is where their main keep is Dragonsoy. Dragonsoy is currently ruled over by one Alexander Drakovich. Um, this is one of the oldest characters in, in Ebenezer. One of the oldest. It's not the oldest, but one of. Um, and Dragonsoy is so named as the House of the Dragon. Now, we're not talking about Vlad Tepesh here. What we are talking about is a literal dragon. 
Um, the dragon, D-R-E-G apostrophe N, is the old word for the dragon, and supposedly under Mount Veresh. And this is a holy site to Nordaga. Um, this god or goddess, this deity of nature, um, who oversees avalanches and natural disasters just as much as a, uh, as a healthy spring uh, light rain and sunshine down on the area. It is said that Nordaga controls the clouds and the dirt. Um, will determine if you uh, uh, will determine if your uh, your harvest uh, around harvest season is going to be bountiful or not, um, depending on the festival or feast that you held seven months ago. In the LARP, if you ever play the LARP and you're watching this, and you will remember that um, you guys held a festival in January, and come October or so, early October, September. Um, the, 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 the bounty was like 20% greater than usual. That is because of Nordaga, who also supposedly still resides within Mount Veresh. Mount Veresh itself also is hold to, um, uh, to the burial chambers of no less five arch druids. And in, in Everdale, druids are all said to be clerics of Nordaga. Um, so that's pretty powerful. So it may be because of Mount Veresh uh, that the Lubushkoi are in the area, or maybe it's just tradition that the, uh, that House Drakovich and the Lubushkoi have always worked together. But not all, um, not all Drosti are so helpful. While down here, you have, uh, the Domarezzi Drosti. The Domarezzi Drosti tend to rule these woods alongside uh, the one who is in Lara Etsu and the one who is in Vordanesti. This area here uh, that surrounds Lake Locht, um, this is polluted with all of the creatures of the night and exactly what that conveys when I say that. Here within all of these mountains, you will find ancient holds of vampires. Here within the woods themselves, you will find uh, all sorts of lycanthropes, but you will also find Strigui, and that comes straight out of Eastern European legend. You're looking at a corpse that is uh, said to be inhabited by a demon to some, and to others it is a corpse uh, with a soul in it that still has a bloodthirsty purpose. Um, it is said if you travel through this region, uh, and you are killed. Your entrails will be nailed to a wall while your skin is worn by the fey of the area. And we are not talking sparkles and happy unicorns here. We are talking nasty, blood-drinking, flesh-eating fey that uh, in inhabit all of Mutfia. If you go through the Mutfia night, you will see wisps that will only lead you to your doom many times at the hands of those fey. There are many different kinds of fey um, all throughout this. I, I haven't even cataloged them all. Um, many of them are, are original, but do have a basis in uh, some real world stuff. Um, this whole, that whole bestiary is still being developed, so pardon me for not having it. Um, you guys voted for Mutfia first. So <laughs> I, I rushed and created this map for you. Um, interestingly, right here in the south of Mutfia, um, you have House Maristev. House Maristev plays heavily in the post-interregnum or the uh, fifth age of Evendale as actually taking over all of these lands up to the point of Drakovich lands. And they end up owning all of this area here, including the Missing Mountain Plains. Um, they already are in the fourth age rather powerful uh, their keep is is vast in a way it mirrors uh dragon soy on the side of mount veresh but their mountain is not as big and as powerful so it's uh, house matters have decided that they were going to copy the most powerful house in all of it and they put their keep on the side of the mountain as well uh, house matters have is one of the few noble houses that is not actually, that was not founded by Mutvians. Instead, House Maristev had uh, the uh, originators of the house, this noble house that came into being about uh, 200 years ago or so in the Fourth Age. Um, they had come from Ivory, way out to the west, 
traveled into the area uh, through here and made their way down. And by the laws of Mutfia, anybody that has uh, that can protect themselves uh, has the right to call themselves a prince if they maintain land. Um, House Marisab has successfully done so for 200 years. So if you like a political game um, and you want to set it in Mutfia, maybe uh, setting it in southern Mutfia with the horrors of uh, Laratu, uh, Laratesu, um and the, the pleasantries of, uh, of House Teshu over here. Teshu is uh, a good trading house. Um, they actually own one of the only parcels of land. It's, uh, it's this nice little green area um, that's not infected by death. So <laughs> Teshu is one of the few places that's actually a little bit normal. It's still wildly deadly as compared to the rest of Evendale, but it's, uh, it's pretty something. Um, it's, it's rather nice, uh, and they are right here on this lake here, Lake Turnu, uh, which is fed by that river that divides, uh, Mutfia from, uh, the Slendari Kingdoms here to the east. There are a variety of other things that, um, that go on within Mutfia, um, and this, uh, for example, here you have the, uh, the Stradu Fens, you're going to see werewolves in this area here. Uh, this is actually fairly extensive. You're looking at about 30 miles wide by about 40 miles uh, tall. Um, this area here is not seeing a lot of action in terms of development or even in gameplay in the old uh, tabletop games. And uh, there's a reason for that. Um, it's wildly unexplored. Um, it's very, very deadly. And PCs typically don't want to go there because there's really nothing to gain. So just like... The villagers who are around the area, and that includes Sorvesti off to its east, and uh, some of the other surrounding um, principalities, no one wants to go there. The land isn't worth anything. It's kind of like Monty Python. You build your castle in a swamp, it's just going to sink and fall over, burn down, and other things like that. Well, the Strahd Fence is exactly that area, so maybe you as a GM or as a player want to investigate that area, um, feel free to create, and as always, I'll be more than happy to assist you if you need any assistance whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to come back up here to Moldev and speak about this uh, this object right here, the Veiled Gate. First off, it is in fact a portal, but the portal is not your typical portal. There are two portals in Mutfia. That happens to be one of them. The other one is right here in Babesti. Uh, Babesti uh, portal is one of the few portals in, within Evendale that is publicly accessible. Where you go when you pass through is up to some debate. Um, uh, you, you are typically taken to another port. All portals lead to other portals. Um, during the, I want to say, at the end of the Second Age is when the portals were created. Who they were created by and w for what purposes, no one ever knows. Um, and while there is a map of the portals that will, get, that will allow you uh, rapid travel from here to there, there's also enough variation amongst them due to a couple of portals uh, that change. They have a, um, a set route. You walk in one side, you will always appear where you're supposed to be. You walk in through the other side and you will always appear where you're supposed to be. It's not, uh, you will not always appear in the exact same place, but sometimes these portals also change. And there's an actual in-character reason for that, um, but it hasn't yet been fully developed, so I'm hesitant to, uh, to talk about it. But this is a travel portal Whereas, uh, this is a travel portal for mortals. Um, the one here in Moldev, um, that the village of Moldev, again, the city, uh, the setting of the LARP. Um, we're going to take it if Charles wants it. Uh, his character is still in charge of it, and that would be Prince Radicek. Um, and it is his, uh, his, uh, his domain in which this portal is. Now, this is the Veiled Gate. It does allow for transportation, but not of mortal spirits. This is the direct link from this world to the Isle of Evendale, or so it is said. The Veiled Gate is actually an area between worlds that Kirisil, this god uh, or deity, oversees. And um, you, as a soul, you come through the Veiled Gate, and then you enter into, uh, into the Isle of Evan after passing through that area. The Veiled Gate itself... Um, uh, it can be seen as an adventure zone. Um, 
no living person would ever want to go in there, obviously. You'll be dead within a matter of minutes. Although there are some, they say, that uh, some drosti go into it to investigate whether or not their actual homeland exists within the veil. And that is where all of their people went. And this is a, uh, akin to a drosti paradise for them. So and they hope, and they say this through song, um, uh, as a, a way of remembering the old legends, that when you die, hopefully we will be able to go to Sulebe. And that's the, uh, the home of peace, uh, the forever home, uh, the land where no prince can tell you ever what to do. So uh, this is Mutvia. Um, there it really truly is so much about it, but I'm going to turn to your questions now. Let me just pull up, uh, pull up Facebook here and see if you guys have posted anything. Um, so yeah, so we have here, are the lycanthropes all wolves? Uh, are there other types? Uh, can they return to humanoid form or permanent ones once transformed? So David, uh, who wrote that question, that's a fantastic question. So here's the deal uh, with that. Um, in Amutvia, there are two kinds of werewolves. There are natural werewolves and there are the afflicted. The afflicted are, um, these are the crazy monsters. These are the ones who are all turned. They're not born that way like the natural are. The afflicted, um, there, are many, uh, there are many that are wolves. Um, some are dogs. There are white ones and black ones. And uh, some say it's the white ones that are, that are nasty and evil, and others say it's the white ones that are good and benefactory, while they say the exact opposite about the black ones. So it's a legends to change. So no one ever really knows what to expect when it comes down to the dogs. Uh, there are werebores as well. The werebores are uh, typically, um, they follow the same rules as, of, uh, as afflicted and natural. Um, so if you are ever bitten by and exchange bodily fluids like saliva or blood with a lycanthrope from Mutvia, you are bound to be plagued by that disease. Uh, I believe cure disease will work in most cases, but it does depend upon the, uh, the, the CR or difficulty rating of the, or challenge rating of that particular monster. If it is above five, um, congrats, you are now genetically changed and it's going to require more powerful magics. It's no longer just a disease. But even then, the lycanthropes of Mutfia are not exactly, um, that we, we don't really follow the rule book when it comes to them. There is a period of time uh, that they have to go through. And it's something like a course over five years where they mature into something that we may know as a werewolf, as in popular legend, your typical eight foot tall, extremely brawny, or what have you. Um, in here, you're looking at something a little bit different. The afflicted werewolves, once bitten, um, you as a victim of this, you will start to um, your personality will change a little bit at first. Uh, it is not really dependent upon the moon at this point, or moons. Remember, there are two. Um, instead, you're going to become angrier over the course of time. Smaller things are going to start setting you off a little bit more easily, and you start going into a rage about halfway through that. And this is about your first year of existence. So about six months into it, you start getting... Uh, uh, you start getting visions and nightmares of um, horrible things that begin to occur uh, to people around you. And, of course, you wake up and you find out that it was you who had actually done it. This is typical. This is, uh, we're, we're going to see this everywhere. It's rather cliche. After the first year, however, things calm down. You begin to gain a little bit of control of your senses. Um, this is rather fortunate. And it's one of the reasons why they think that all, all throughout Mutfia, uh, werewolves, um, particularly the afflicted, are really nothing more than, well, particularly the South. The South tends to believe that uh, that afflicted werewolves are really nothing more than humans who have gone crazy. And this is the reason for it. Most Mutfians will hunt down these people who are, who are showing this kind of lunacy and kill them outright. They want, they'll cut off their heads, salt the earth, bury them. Um, stake their heart, they will put garlic in their decapitated mouth and, and all sorts of things, just to make sure that they never get back up. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the practice for everything that dies in Woodfield, by the way. Uh, cut off its head, put garlic in its mouth, salt the earth where it died, um, bury the head and the body in separate pits, uh, burn them, 
uh, sprinkle the ashes across it. I mean, it's all sorts of things that you need to do to keep people in the ground there. Put giant rocks on top of them, put spear points through them, etc. So um, after the first year, however, you begin to calm down. Once you have calmed down, um, that's really when you start going through the bodily change. Uh, some say you, you first turn into a dog that slowly gets more and more feral and hence a wolf. Others say that dogs, um, I want to call, I want to call them the pretty leaky. And I, I forget, um, the, the dog, uh, lycanthropes, um, tend to hang around the villages a little bit. Um, and sometimes they, the, the beneficial ones will hang around and actually help out hunters and other things like that. While those that are wolves or boar or what have you, um, you're going to see them more out in the wild, so, uh, particularly this area here, all of these woods here that I'm pointing at. That's really where you're going to see the afflicted. Now, the natural werewolves, the natural lycanthropes, these are born. There are families of them. They are all, um, no mutrian wants them around, uh, anyone who is not one of them, that is. And so they tend to keep their... Um, they tend to keep their identity secret. There's a rumor that the Lubushkoi Drosti are all natural werewolves, and yet there's really no evidence of it. Um, but plenty of rumor, particularly up in the north, uh, in this region right here. Uh, this is where they say that lots of wolves are. And of course there are. It's, it's an alpine area. It's nice and chilly. There's a reason to, that a lot of people don't hunt these lands, and that's a good reason for all the wolves to be there. But the Lubushkoi Drosti also uh, patrol this area. Um, they call this their homeland. This is actually the homeland right here. Um, their homeland also extended down here, really to the north of all of this. Um, and they have uh, several burial grounds all throughout, particularly in Moldev itself. By the way, uh, talking about Moldev, uh, if you watched the deities uh, video, the gods video, and you watched the countries video, I think I mentioned it in countries, um, there are certain uh, religious scholars who thoroughly believe that Eben was killed right here, right here, and this is why there is a veiled gate. Now, when we are talking about Eben, a quick little refresher. Um, Cynthia created all the physical worlds, so she started off with the elements, and from them created the elementals, from them the fae, then the elves, and then things kind of evolved from there with uh, every now and then um, her giving a helping hand to things. Well, at some point, she had created a consort by the name of Avine, um, who then addressed all the living races or all the living species after they had said that there was an overpopulation because nothing would die. She was a deity of life, and so nothing died. Well, Slynn apparently came to a meeting place, which was supposedly right here, and slew Evan uh, with the very first weapon. It was happened to be a crude iron blade. Um, that weapon killed Avin. His blood spread all throughout the world, and uh, and particularly Mutvia, the soil soaked it in. And it's at that point that they say that Sithlia and Nordaga split because Sithlia, being a deity of life, couldn't be in a land where death now existed, and so got uh, exiled. Actually, it'd be that way exiled out to the Isle of Evan, while uh, Nordaga, a new facet of Scythia, said to be her sister, uh, began to oversee the natural world. Well, if you take a look at the map, I had wanted to represent that, and particularly in this area, you'll notice that there are areas on the map that have a rusty brown to it. This is the, uh, the areas, like right in here, look at that. Um, these are the areas that are said to be plagued heavily with Avian's blood. And if you pick up the, the soil and rub it between your fingers, and you'll see it leaves behind a rusty brown or very, or almost black, uh, just like old dried, well, old blood, old coagulated blood will uh, it'll, it'll turn black after some time. Um, that's what you'll see there in the soil, along with the grease that they say it was the rendered fat of all the humans who had died during the Lurtane War, and everyone else who had ever been torn limb from limb. So, uh, are there other types of lycanthropes here? Not really. And you're going to see your boar, your dogs, your wolves. You, um, there may be a couple of others that uh, maybe your GM or maybe you, if you want to run it in, uh, in Evandale, run a game, maybe you decide that's something else there. I can tell you that uh, rat lycanthropes do exist. They tend to exist in Kultrek, which is, I have to get my bearings correct. Uh, no, no, this, oh, damn it, this way. Sorry, <laughs> it's off to the east. Um, Kultrek is out over that way. 
Um, and you're going to see some of the Ratkin over there. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions that are here. Um, yeah, so we do have a couple more. Does the garlic get used up at the street guard visit the home? Gee, Lou! <laughs> is there a particular reason why you're asking that question? <laughs> so, Lou is one of the players in, um, uh, Lou Martinez, everyone. This is uh, one of the players in the YouTube series, uh, the Eminem Online series. And, um, uh, in the in one of the last episodes, uh, the second to last episode, I want to say episode seventeen, they came they, they came across a small village, and the village was visited at night by these uh, creatures that had echoing voices and other things like that, and they were calling out um, to some of the characters as they tried to stay inside of their home. Um, and they had garlic above the door. And in the morning, after these things had left, they found that the garlic was completely desiccated. It was, it was dried up and used up. So is that the case? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, certainly uh, magical components when used as part of a spell are typically consumed. So if we follow standard tabletop game uh, rules, then yeah, that would stand to be the case. So I, I leave that up to you. <laughs> Let's see if I definitely dodge that one. Uh, David also asked, and if so, certain adventures got real lucky that one of them is a vegetarian. Oh, what's the reference? What do you mean? What do you mean? Rock spears and especially the females. I don't know what you're talking about, David. Oh, help me, help me, uh, help me understand. Um, so let me go to my notes here and see if there's anything else here. Yeah. So there is. Um, there is another section here that I do want to tell you a little something about. And while it falls outside of the, quote, official borders of Mutfia, some nobles continue to hold on to it, like Boristi over here. Uh, you have Roganoi down here. There's a couple of other houses that are really minor. But there's also this one right here, Sveasti. Sve is a actual, um, it's a name of a place in Tumbria. Now, Tumbria happens to be this country down here. Uh, it's just the start of it. This would be considered Northern Tumbria. Tumbria uh, is also where a particular person by the name of Nesaris had taken up uh, residence for a little bit of time and it became known as Nesaris Re Sve. Re means from. So Nesaris from Sve was the name that he had taken when he moved to Tumbria. Then he decided he was going to move to Mutfia, but didn't want to cause a war or anything like that. So he simply took over these lands that nobody wanted because the entire thing is filled up with cracks and other things like that. Well, it is said, or at least that's the story that his PR people will give you, this story that uh, others say, particularly Roganoi and others that have come into this area, um, supposedly Marisdeb has also visited this area, is that Sve has the power to manipulate the land and swallow people up if they come to invade. And that's why it kind of looks a little bit dead. He also lives in a tower. Now, if you watch the YouTube video or the YouTube series and you come across a character by the name of Nesaris and he says he lives in southeast Mutfia, that's where he is. So there's the map of it. Uh, that's where his home is. It's in an old collapsed tower and there that is. Uh, let me go to, uh, back to Facebook and see if we have anything here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Lubash means children of the wolves. Yes, actually it does. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah, Lubash, uh, Lupe, um, we're borrowing, uh, from the romance languages in the real world. Uh, there it, you're talking about wolves and Lubash the children of the wolves. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a thing. Um, the person who made that comment, by the way, is Jeff Davis. He's the person who created the Lupers Koi, and he's the player from the original 1991-1992 campaign, or 1990-1992 campaign. Um, so I'm going to like that one. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Nope. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my notes. Um, you have other landmarks within Mutvia, uh, particularly. Well, sorry about that. You have, uh, of course, Mount Verich, which I've also which I've spoken about. But you also have this right here, Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock is of particular note. There was a period of time when the gods are said to have slumbered or that humans have forgotten how to worship the gods and that the feasts and the festivals of the land were completely forgotten. It is said here on Eagle Rock that Nordaga 
came to life and inhabited Mutvia once again. Now, there's a couple of conflicting reports uh, pertaining to that. Eagle Rock was overseen by an arch druid by the name of Cosma. Uh, Cosma was a pretty cool guy. He was, he was really, really old. Um, he oversaw this whole area. As a matter of fact, all of the druids of Mutvia, they say. Um, he, when he died, he was said to have been buried here at Eagle Rock. Um, and, uh, but his body, there's an official tomb within Mount Vedich as well. So there's some debate there, but Eagle Rock is another holy site. It's really only for the, uh, I mean, if I had to draw, uh, comparisons, Eagle Rock would really be for the Druids while Mount Vedich is kind of like the tourist attraction. Um, but both of them are legit. Um, that's that. There's also this, which is Gajesti, and Gajesti are ruins. It was a small village that has been plagued by death. And to visit this, um, the people within it don't necessarily know that they, there are people there, but they don't exactly know that they are dead. And so when you visit it during the day, everything seems okay. And then at night, weird things begin to happen. It's also said that the inhabitants of Gajesti, uh, the entire village actually will pick up and go somewhere else, um, particularly if Mutfi is in their future. So we don't know exactly what's happening there, but if um, you pay attention on the Facebook page, uh, we started up a player community, and the player community is known as the Fortune's End. Well, the Fortune's End is the name of a tavern that, or an inn properly, an inn, a place where you can stay overnight, um, entering Pierre Dembleau. Um The Fortune's End first appeared here in a place known as Gajesti, and it was uh, unbeknownst to the party that had gone through it um, that this was a ruined village or what have you. But the Fortune's End now picks up and goes in other places. The Fortune's End got its name because that's the sign that is there. It is still written in Mutfian. Actually, let me see what I can find. I'll I have to find that. I'll tag it and I'll, I'll post it in the comments below. But also if you belong to the players, um, to the player community, uh, which you can, anybody can, can go up there. Um, if you belong to the player community, then you'll see the logo is posted there. I believe it's pinned there and it even gives a legend of the fortune's end. Um, outside of Mutfia, they say it's the same tavern, but the tavern takes its own appearance depending upon where it is. And it always seems to fit in. Um, no one has ever seen it come and go. Um, but you'll turn your back and all of a sudden it's not there anymore. In Mutfia, they don't like the fortune's end because it's weird. It's different. It's full of magic and no one trusts it. So, and with good reason, if you're in Mutfia and there's magic around, you don't trust anybody. So yeah, just kill everything. Uh, let me go back to my notes. So yeah, there's the Babasti portal, which I talked about, which is the travel portal all the way up to the north that links to several of the others within Ebendale. But again, it's the only one that is actually publicly accessible. Um, you have uh, the area out to the southwest. You have the Vodersnaya woods to the northeast, and that's the, primarily the, the afflicted werewolves. Um, when it comes down to resources, imports, and exports, um, Mutvia really is known for survival, uh, obviously. But uh, it's not really an import, uh, but it is considered a, a resource. <laughs> it's, uh, or an export, rather. It's considered a resource. Um, it's something that you definitely want to get your hands on by befriending some of the villagers. In order to do that, you really need to show trust over, over the course of time, and you need to show yourself as a pleasant spirit. Um, they consider everything a spirit. Humans are spirits in Mutfia. Spirits are spirits. Uh, werewolves are spirits. So everything is a spirit. It's just whether or not it inhabits a physical body and if it can affect you with its corporeal or incorporeal form. Um, there, I've uh, spoken about the cultures. Again, if you're looking for something that's, uh, that is frightening and nightmares, um, oh, like, for example, I had mentioned this, I believe, during the country's video. There was a party that had come through Mutfia, and they had horses, and they had, uh, you know, travelers, etc. They came through uh, one particular village, and the villagers just simply walked into their homes, shut, locked their doors, closed all their shutters. And the village, uh, the PCs were like, what the hell is going on? And one person opened the door, and opened and peeked outside, and said, come here. And said, you go to stay, go to safe house a mile outside the village, go and put your horses in trees. And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, they got there and they found it was in the swamps. Um, I can even show you where it was. So this will give you an example. 
Uh, where are the where are the fins? Where are the fins? Oh, here they are. So this was just on the outside of the Strado fins. Um, this the villager saved their lives. The the villager admitted that you know I mean to themselves anyway through practice that the PCs could not stay there. No one can stay inside the villages if they don't want you there. They will kill you. It's 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 you try inhabiting a, a barn. When you think no one is watching, and they will find you. They will kill you in the middle of the night. You're, you will have peasants with uh, torches and pitchforks standing at your feet and, and getting ready to stab you. Um, when they came into the fens, they found these houses up on stilts. And they did, oh, like, why is that? And there were scrape marks all along the posts, these heavy trees that were cut down and turned into posts upon which these houses stood. Um, well, it's because the werewolves in the area would come and try to eat you, but for some reason they didn't like climbing these, uh, climbing the posts. Um, but your horses, I mean, you can't bring the horse up, so there was a pulley system in some of the trees, um, and definitely the PCs had their own pulley system. Uh, the player there, Sasha, fantastic player, um, he brought his own, um, tack and, uh, uh, tack and block, uh, block, block and tackle. Um, and put them and put the horses up in the trees, and the horses survived until the morning because the werewolves couldn't reach them. So that's your typical story. If you want to go on the comical side of it, yeah, yeah. How how did what craziness, what zaniness did you have to come up with in order to actually survive? Uh, so that that's one way that you can tell the story around here. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, does the entirety of the Gajesti population creepily greet visitors that stay in the village overnight? <laughs> it's all right, Lou. So, uh, <laughs> no, the villagers of Gajesti, they will greet you. Um, with a, they will always be polite. Um, they're very welcoming. They, they like seeing people, particularly those that remind you that um, remind them that they uh, are alive. And um, they will even give you food. They will give you a drink. They will invite you into their home. And at night, they usually have a place where you can stay inside the village because there's always a place where you can stay inside the Gajesti. Um, and, uh, and in the morning, maybe they will greet you with some scones and tea. Next question. Uh, let's see. No, we don't have anything else here. So, uh, hi, Tara. Uh, and hi, Dave. And hi, Ken. So we have, oh, cool. We have more people joining. So let's see what else we have here. Um, there are no real nightly orders within uh, within Mutfia, but I can talk about some of the uh, some of the, the ways that society is developed uh, or is broken up in Mutfia itself. So first off, um, your noble houses each have different functions. Sometimes you can have an academic house such as Svei. House Svei is just known to practice magic. Well, there's a reason for that, because Nesaris Svei is one of the leaders of Amstrad. This happens to be his summer home down in Muthia, or at least that's how some take it. Um, I mean, I'm kind of throwing it out there. It's kind of like a, eh, maybe. But, um, I mean, read into that however you want. Nesaris is one of the nine of the Cerulean Cabal, which oversees Amstrad. He makes his home in Muthia, um, and he practices a lot of magic. So... Uh, you have some of these academic houses also that, that study Nordaga's effect within Mutfia, and that house may be uh, full of clerics. While you have uh, provincial houses or uh, noble houses uh, that are land-owning, such as Drakovic, uh, Drakovic is, uh, as I had been saying, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful. They have a standing army in the thousands that are spread throughout the land in various holes here and there. You will know when you're in Dragovich territory because chances are you will be greeted at sword point, and then you have to prove who you are and whether or not you mean uh, House Dragovich and his lands any harm, and particularly Nordaga. So House Dragovich is actually separated into two. Um, one is a slightly academic house, which is overseen by the priests of Nordaga or clerics in uh, gaming parlance, uh, and the other one are the nobles themselves who uh, conduct the administration of the lands itself. Um, you're going to find a variety of nobles within that house, and I, I encourage you to break down your houses. If you want to develop a noble house from Mutfia, uh, break it down with an absolute structure. There's another house in here I'm going to talk about, which is Corvagera. Uh, Corvagera means Raven's Mouth, and this is the Mad Prince of Raven's Mouth. Um, this is not a hereditary house uh, akin to like a Gergesoy or, or Dragovich or what have you. Um, this is a house which is held... Uh, by the just the simply the strongest individual there. He also happens to be absolutely insane. Um, so some houses are powerful in their own right, but not hereditary. 
Um, other houses like Ajdabesti, Ajdabesti was handed to him um, by his father who had overtaken the lands by killing the former prince. So while this is hereditary and still powerful, it is actually a new house for all intents and purposes. Uh, Ranobesti is a, definitely a powerful house. They own pretty much all of these mountains and uh, all the land coming up here to, uh, along the Gergi River, um, etc. And that's pretty much it when it comes down to the noble houses. Uh, certainly you can create many of them because again, it's a land of a thousand princes and there's like 500 of them. If I were to litter this map with all of the names of the houses that I can come up with, you wouldn't see any other features. So feel free to uh, do whatever it is you want. Some houses have historical significance, such as House Kaganov, um, which is, uh, they hold the far southwest. Uh, they are not on this map, and maybe I should put them there. Uh, they hold the far southwest, and mainly they hold customs. They're kind of like a greeting house, if you will. For some reason, they, they decide to insert themselves in Woodfian society by greeting villagers who are greeting travelers who come into the area and kind of school them on Mutfi. That's kind of odd, and well, that's that's just House Kaganov. And then you have House Gergoy, which was up there on the map. As a matter of fact, you can see it over there on the left. Um, House Vey and House uh, Basbesti, which is uh, up to the north. House Basbesti is, um, also has some historical significance. Uh, they are said to be a house that was originally founded by Drosti, and over the course of time just ended up owning lands and turned into an actual noble house. Of the Drosti families, I had gone over the Zaganesti, the Wodenkai, the Luperskoi, the Domaretsi, and the Vladis. Now, the Vladis are still around. As a matter of fact, you will see the Vladis over here on the eastern border, I believe. Right here, the Vladis. And right to the south of that, the Vladis uh, Mountains. Um, with this horrible, horrible-looking thing. Um, this is an ancient sacrificial point for Nordaga. And they say it is now dedicated to demons. Lovely. So uh, what exactly happened to, uh, to Vladis? Well, Vladis was another Drosti uh, family. They settled into the area. They ended up killing uh, the noble and, uh, and inhabiting these mountains. That's one rumor. The other one is, is that they were here in Amstrad. And uh, while things were going down of a, of a horrible nature, uh, the nobles of this area fled Amstrad. This is Amstrad, yeah. Fled Amstrad, came in across the river here and into Mutvia, where they ended up settling. And um, they say that some members of House Vladis still have the bright blue crystal, like, like sky blue, like summer day sky blue eyes of that old noble house. And all of these lands are held by Drosti that claim no uh, familial lineage or ancestry from any of their major uh, clans. So that's up to you um, and does really show that there's a always a blurred line when it comes to these things. Nothing is really cut and dry when it comes to anywhere in Evandale. Everything is always blurry. So you as a GM or DM, by all means, take advantage of that. Um, when it comes down to the commoners and the peasantry, one of their major forms of protection against the nobles in the area or against... Um, bloodthirsty savages uh, like werewolves or what have you um, is to form up in guilds. And so families don't really have any power in, in, and, um, uh, in and amongst themselves. You know, a large peasant family is just a large bunch of people that are always starving. Well, they will form up into guilds. And in this case, there are some that have uh, taken on a, a real purpose and meaning within uh, within Mutfia, such as the Guild of the Branch, which are a, a bunch of Nordaga dedicants. They are eradicators of Nordaga's enemies. Anything that is against nature, they go out there and they kill. Um, there is the Crossroads Trading Company, which has its origins in the tabletop game. Um, the Crossroads Trading Company is known for their trade all throughout Mutfia. They're one of the few that actually has... Uh, agreements with a lot of princes where they can come and go as needed, providing they show the, uh, the, the various patrols uh, their documents of passage. Uh, there's the Guild of the Mortar and Pestle, um, which is more akin to an alchemist guild or what have you. Um, and it really is, yeah, I, I have it listed here as it's not really a secret society. But it's definitely a society with secrets, and it can, there are many hundreds of small apothecarial guilds uh, across the country, but the Mortar and Pestle Guild is one of the only that have unlocked the actual secrets of alchemy. 
And that is, uh, for those of you making it, uh, who play Pathfinder and want to use this world, you're going to see that transition really in Pathfinder 1.0 Alchemist to the Pathfinder 2.0 Alchemist. And this is one way that you can, uh, uh, that you can do that without breaking the meta, if you will. Um, there's also the Northern Crafters Company, which is really just crafters. They all join together to make sure that crafters all get their due and that a local prince doesn't um, really take advantage, of, uh, take advantage of their power. All princes are draconic. All princes are said to be tied to the land. Almost Arthurian in nature, where the land dictates the prince, the prince dictates the land, and the weather reflects the prince's, uh, you know, whatever. Um, the Northern Crafters Company is what you might see as the first attempt at a union, at a unionization. And if that's too modern for you, then feel free to leave it out. But um, I, I can tell you that in Whitby, as such organization on the part of the, uh, of the peasantry is only going to be overthrown by a local prince somewhere. So unfortunately, they are doomed. Then you have the Hammer and Thorn, or maybe they're not your version of the world. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the Hammer and Thorn, while the Guild of the Branch hunts uh, uses of dark magic, of those things which are said to be against Nordaga, members of the Hammer and Thorn Expeditionary Company and Mercenary Fellowship, they hunt the things that go bump in the night. These are monster hunters. They don't exactly have chapters or halls somewhere that you can visit, um, or maybe they do, and that is entirely up to you to determine. In my version of the world, they're just getting started, and um, there are some who travel around on horseback and hand out pamphlets. There's a slight problem with this marketing campaign. Most people in Mutvia can't read. So <laughs> while I've taken the time to develop a cipher for and even something of a, a, a small... Um, uh, a glossary of, of uh, Mutvian words. Um, ironically, there's not a lot of people who would use that alphabet or use that cipher. Uh, yeah, there's only about 20 of them right now, so maybe that'll grow in time. So when it comes to the people of Mutvia, again, we're talking about xenophobes, don't want to have anything to do with you. Uh, Mutvia has turned into one of, the, uh, uh, one of the favorite places because of the xenophobia. It's a land of mystery. Um, everything is dark. Black clouds always seem to follow everything. The land is dark and, uh, and just really rude. So where do you go as a player character in this world? Well, really, um, you venture around and see what you come across. Every prince will be different. And for uh, GMs or DMs that like that, um, that, that like being that don't mind getting caught off guard. Mutvi is a fantastic place to allow your PCs to go, um, have fun with uh, interacting uh, with the PCs as different uh, merchants, as drosti, uh, as nobles, and what have you. Um, always have a soundtrack or sound of uh, like thunder and lightning everywhere you go. I mean, that's you know pretty much what we had here, right? Well, where is it? There we go. So, yeah, so, <laughs> so feel free to have that. Um, if you happen to have lights, turn them down, light up some candles, place them about. Uh, Mutvi is definitely a place where you want to have uh, ambiance uh, as, you, uh, as you play within it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, Corbregera, welcoming to Tengu. Um, Corbregera is only so named because their banner uh, traditionally has the head of a raven on it. Um, I wouldn't say that they're welcoming to Tengu per se, um, mainly because Mutvia is not really welcoming to Tengu or really anyone on the outside. Um, but again, that's really up to your GM or DM to determine. And considering, hey Lou, considering I'm your GM or DM, I guess I'll just have to tell you, mm, you'll have to find out. Uh, yeah, blood magic, absolutely blood magic. Clerics, yes, Tara, 100%. There's clerics all throughout. And these are, um, I wouldn't say, you know, I, ironically, while the Mutvians are incredibly superstitious, they seem, they, they seem to have replaced the religions which are there with actual, uh, with, with the, Deities exist in Evendale, right? That's, all, that's part of the fantasy setting. And so it's kind of difficult to disprove existence of deity, considering that a cleric can just go and create food and water. Um, of course, some say, well, that's actually arcane magic. And some do that. Some are completely a-religious and only believe in arcane magic and believe that the clerics are um, just using that uh, to their effects. 
But when deity actually shows up and, and you can't refute it, or demons or devils show up, and then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, they're talking about these beings that exist as part of the Tears or the Adahar, a class of gods, um, you would think that the Mutvians would be a little bit more religious. They're, they're actually not. They're about on par with everyone else, but the clerics tend to take on a more severe form. You're not going to find those who convert, but rather those who educate for purposes of, uh, of survival. Um, and you're going to find clerics that, uh, that go into the woods in order as a test uh, to prove their worth to deity, that they can survive in these conditions. In fact, and, uh, tangential to that, I would have to say that the Mutvian notion of survival, what they consider day-to-day -day life, is so extreme compared to what others uh, go through in the world of Ebenda, with, the, with only a couple of exceptions, honestly, Dra Anan being one of them, um, Nudvriu in some cases, and Drakamor, which I didn't even touch in the country's video because it's technically not part of this continent, Ernal. Um, Mutvia is really seen as a backwards community uh, by the standards of more, uh, more, quote, civilized nations, uh, such as Tungria and Ivari, but as far as their understanding of um, how to circumvent uh, the plague and other things that continue to bother all these other nations, Murphy actually stands ahead of the game, and a lot of that has to do with their clerics. Um, the vegetarian comment was a, oh, the vegetarian comment was a reference to the uh, Black Wreath campaign that you mentioned. Oh yeah, Lewis is a pirate, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, thank you for, for telling me about that. Uh, Lou, are they allowed to stay more than two nights? <laughs> Dude, you're killing me. Um, I guess you're going to have to send PC to uh, Gajesti and find out. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, I have no more notes when it comes down to Mutfia, and yet I could talk for more hours on this particular country than any other. Um, but already we've been here for 90 minutes together. If you happen to like Mutfia, like the video, do uh, uh, please uh, uh, please like it. Please feel free to share. If you have any gaming groups or something like that, feel free to share there. If the GM's looking for options uh, for things to do, this is great. If you are a member of Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Evandale, and you're in at the $5, um, the cartography fiend, I believe I call it, um, you will get this high-res map uh, behind me, this one here. Um, you will get this uh, map as as 4K, and I just up this thing to a printable size at 300 DPI at 15 by 30, or no, excuse me, 26 by something stupid. So it's just, <laughs> the thing is immense. Um, all of the future maps as well are going to be done above 4K, about twice the size of 4K from here on out. I just realized that, uh, that I can do that and not drive myself insane. So uh, if you are a member of Patreon at the $5 a month deal, you will continue to receive all of these maps. You will already have access to anything that had been priorly released um, by all means. And if you decide to stay on, there are additional benefits to it as well. Um, all that, of course, is up on Patreon. If, and if you want to follow YouTube, please, 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 please subscribe and then click on that bell to receive the notifications. We are at last check 61 subscribers. Um, please come in and, uh, and subscribe to the video. Not only is it the online gaming series, so maybe you're not even, uh, um, maybe you're not someone who wants to watch some other people game. Totally cool. I understand that. Um, I have a difficult time doing that myself, uh, despite the fact having a YouTube series. But instead, these kinds of videos will also go up on YouTube. As a matter of fact, this one's going to go up there almost immediately. Um, and then, of course, you'll be notified of that. Besides, when we reach 100, I'm going to try to change the URL from this long, extensive alphanumeric thing to slash Evandale. So uh, please, if you enjoy what it is that you're watching, go ahead and join us. But in the meantime, uh, I, I sincerely hope that you like this. If you want to know more, leave some comments down below. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, but in the meantime, I will say to you, Brusel Devro Mutvi, which simply means goodbye and Gorsi Surve il Pelika. So that is strength, safety, and peace to you all. Be well, everyone, and thanks for joining me on the story of Evandale. I now turn the world back to you.